Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining me today for day nine of the Light Wellness Experience Workshop. Now, today you are going to be speaking with Lena Huberman, a speech language pathologist. And, uh, you know, of course, throughout the, the, the last nine days, we have had so much incredible education, insight, and support coming from client testimonies, uh, personal education and know-how, interdisciplinary conversations, right? And uh, I'm trying, I want to bring it all together today. And if, you know, if any of you had watched the uh, original video that I had posted from the very beginning of you know March, where we started marketing for this workshop and, and bringing all of you in, um, you know, I gave a little introduction to myself. And inside that introduction, I mentioned that my son was born uh, prematurely and that we were in the NICU and that we had a number of uh, health uh, issues that we needed to overcome. So today I'm going to be providing a little bit more insight to that and sharing more specifically about his story. Um, yes. Have I used light wellness personally in order to enhance my well-being? Yes. I have, and I saw incredible results. Have we seen uh, studies over the course of the last, you know, 20 to 30 years showing the impact on health and well-being in preventative health care? Yes, we have. But the reason why we developed this program to make it personalized for you was because there is no better way to understand the value of becoming light conscious like a personal experience. And while I had my own personal experience and I thought that, that was enough, God had something very different in plan for me. And uh, I started the Light Vitality Group in January of 2017. In December of 2017, when I was a year in and things were really starting to move forward, right, I found out that I was pregnant with my son, Luca. And Luca, we actually named him Luca because it means the bringer of light, right? Um, I had originally started developing this community education as free workshops for the community members in New York City. And uh, we realized that there was a huge gap in the market, that everything we were doing on the lighting and build and design side in order to meet the healthcare needs of the individuals that we wanted to serve, right? They weren't there meeting us in the middle because they didn't know about this yet. And so it became incumbent upon us to not just create systems and solutions for all of you, but to educate you as well. And that's where this light wellness workshop came into play. It's where when we first originally started back in 2017, I created partnerships with healthcare or sorry, with food uh, nutritionists and, or uh, kind of food vendors and nutritionists and people engaged in healthy lifestyles, yoga instructors. I once partnered with um, an organic mattress manufacturer to play on the sleep health uh, conversation. And, you know, sometimes we would have one person show up for those free workshops where I would sit and talk for an hour to two hours. And sometimes we would have a dozen individuals show up. There was always only a small amount. And that's why I'm so encouraged that so many people now, four years later, are listening to the light wellness conversation, right? Now, I didn't expect it to take four years to get 100 people to show up to watch videos about light uh, sleep health education. I didn't expect it to take four years in order to get a thousand individuals registered to even consider listening to sleep health and education. But it took four years. And it took four years because at the end of year one of Light Vitality Group, I found out that I was going to be having Luca. And within four months of finding out that I was pregnant, Luca was born. He was born at 25 weeks, premature. 
And uh, his projected due date was uh, over three months later. And while we had every hope and every intention of bringing him home on his due date, it just wasn't in the cards for us. We wound up spending seven months in the NICU and we wound up spending another two years after that going in and out of the hospital for a total of now nine major medical procedures. Luca has had stomach surgeries. He's had two stomach surgeries. He has had uh, two urology surgeries. He has had spinal surgery. He has had laser eye surgery. He has had open heart surgery and he has had three uh, major heart catheterizations. He has a feeding tube and he is on oxygen. Right? Um, Luca had a lot of issues that needed to be dealt with medically. And the only place that they could do that was inside the hospital. And me being a light wellness practitioner and a lighting designer, I was very uh, invested in knowing that his circadian health was going to hold up because I knew from firsthand experience and from clinical research and from design practice that he wasn't going to have a fighting chance if he didn't have a healthy aligned circadian rhythm uh, and circadian health. And so we had him situated uh, in a pod on the seventh floor, southern facing, basically floor to ceiling windows. And um, and he thrived. Luca had a zero to five percent chance of survival when he was born. And he didn't uh, typically uh, kind of adhere to any of the clinical markers or uh, clinical treatments that normally uh, healthcare professionals and his specialists saw results out of. He didn't respond to them. Um, but he did respond to every Hail Mary we threw at him. Hail Marys like taking him off of the ventilator rather than keeping him on. Hail Marys like stripping away certain medications to let his body fight and do what it was naturally meant to do, right? Instead of providing more inter medical intervention, we realized that Luca wanted to survive. He wanted to thrive on his own. And so we started stripping away medical interventions. Around three months into our NICU journey, there was an equipment malfunction. The oxygen on his wall inside his pod uh, just stopped working. So while he was no longer on ventilation, he did still have oxygen support. And uh, so he had to be moved immediately because he needed oxygen. The only place that was available at the time when that emergency happened was in a pod located in the center of the hospital with absolutely no access to daylight. And there was uh, actually a kind of not a running joke, if you will, but there was a running understanding that the babies located in that section of the NICU did not thrive and did not do well. So much to the point that it was verbally stated by administrative staff, by nursing staff, that this is where they put the babies with that have failure to thrive. And I realized that that wasn't my son. If anything, my son was kicking ass, right? He was kicking ass and he was taking names. But the moment that he moved from that southern facing pod of with full daylight to that inner core with only electric light, he started to fail immediately. He stopped sleeping okay? and he stopped eating properly and digesting properly, right? Well, he stopped digesting. So he was getting too full, but he couldn't produce a bowel movement. And so it was getting stuck in him. And then he wasn't metabolizing. And then he was in pain. So he would cry and that would prevent him from sleeping. And then he started throwing things up and vomiting constantly because he had so much food in his system that he couldn't expel, right? Then he started developing allergic reactions. He started developing constant heart arrhythmias. His oxygen was fluctuating more than usual, right? Um, he, was, he was starting to yellow more uh, because the medicine that he was on uh, could uh, produce liver damage. And so his body, his immune system wasn't handling all of the medical intervention. And so we started to see, you know, some signs of liver disease. 
his human growth hormone was depleted. He was receiving barely any, his body was producing barely any human growth hormone. And so I started looking at all of these issues and I realized that one by one, they checked off very major functions of circadian health. And so I started holding one-on-one meetings with his specialists and his medical providers and trying to figure out what they thought it was and what they were doing to address it and finding kind of the gaps in the communication and the reporting um, by all the medical teams that had he had transitioned over into over the course of the last, you know, three to four months. And once I realized that no one had an answer and no one's information really lined up properly and that there was a very significant tie to circadian disruption, I had them hold a group meeting, a team meeting with all the specialists in one room with their support network, their nurse practitioners, their fellows, their residents. There was about 30 people in one room because at the time my son had 12 specialists and um, and we were able to identify after about an hour and a half going one by one through everyone that there were six major biofunctions of circadian health that were misaligned or that were being impacted. And that gave me enough, uh, enough, I guess you could say responsibility, if you will, inside that conversation to request for him to, uh, or enough validity to request for him to be relocated immediately to an area with daylight and give them 40, 24 to 48 hours to find a location with access to daylight and have him moved. Uh, They abided by my request and within 48 hours, my son was relocated from that core of the building with electric light to an area about uh, 20 feet away from uh, a southern facing window rather than being about four feet away from a southern facing window. And so um, again, we saw a complete 180 my son who was thriving between zero to three months was back, right? He was sleeping, he was pooping, he was eating, he stopped throwing up, he stopped having allergic reactions, right? We started to see his skin color normalize, his, he stopped having heart arrhythmias, he started, his oxygen started becoming more regulated and he was able to self-correct as they say uh, in the medical terms rather than requiring so much extra uh, support. And we all saw something incredible that day. That Luca, who is just about to join me, right? (laughs) <laughs> that he yeah, thank you he thrived in daylight we saw him go from losing weight to gaining almost two and a half pounds which was unheard of right people would come from their time off nurses would come from their time off sometimes one or two weeks from their vacation or just from their regular shift change and say that's not like that's not the same baby right Um, most recently he had his open heart surgery in October of 2020 during the pandemic. And we, uh, so we were told that typical surgeries would, um, wind up, he would be in the PICU post-op for between three to five days. Um, and then that he would be in a regular recovery suite for probably another five to seven days. So we were looking at around a minimum of a 10 day stay inside the hospital. Um, but with being in my practice, I was very diligent about opening the shades and closing the shades and making sure he had access to Southern daylight, um, rather than, you know, Northern daylight. And, uh, they worked with me in making sure that we had all the measures that I had requested, um, because Luca was kind of an anomaly and a, a very regular patient. So they were willing to work with us in this capacity. And by this time I had had enough conversations drilling in how important light was to circadian health and had them having seen firsthand just how well he was doing a baby who had zero to 5% chance, who was just kicking butt and taking names. Um, they were willing to work with us in that respect. And so we, uh, we tailored his light intake from morning to night. He was out of the PICU on day three and we were home by day six. 
and he was standing up and walking around and playing and happy and in barely any pain by day seven. And it just baffled everyone how remarkable his recovery has been time and time again, especially for a baby who had such severe chronic illness. It's just, it was unheard of. Um, it's a big reason why the uh, cardiology team at his hospital has requested that I write a research paper for them so that they can contribute and deliver to the NICU center so that we can start seeing healthy lighting systems realized in these types of facilities and give these children a fighting chance, a fighting chance that they never had before and that we never knew they needed. Right. Um, you know, with that said, uh, we have had, because of Luca's uh, health conditions, we have had a number of therapies, uh, home therapies uh, up until this point. We had physical therapy, occupational therapy, speech and language therapy. Um, he was having eight appointments a week, right? Um, two for, for each specialist and with SLP uh, being a little special because it was both speech therapy and feeding therapy because of Luca's uh, G-tube, his gastrointestinal tube that we were feeding through. And uh, we did not have the best luck um, for any of you who are joining us who are special needs parents. I, I'm sure you can relate to the, um, the hardship of setbacks. And the older that your child gets, the less the setback is physio or physiological and biological, and it's more psychological. And, uh, and you have to get over that kind of mental hurdle as well. And so we went through a big setback that Luca stopped eating for six months, like would not put anything in his mouth, wouldn't receive any food. We had to go back to solely feeding on his G2. And, um, and then that is a speech and language pathologist. She joined Luca's services in, I want to say it was, it was right around April. It was, uh, it was, it might've been March. I think it was March of 2020. It was right before the pandemic. So it may have even been the tail end of February, but it was right before the pandemic. So, um, or actually Lena started a little bit after Lena started right after the pandemic. I think it was April. Either way, it's been a year. And um, for the first half of the pandemic, we were required to uh, do telehealth appointments and telehealth services rather than in-person services for obvious reasons, right? Um, and over the course of about four to six months of working with Lena, you know, she was providing incredible service for our son. He started touching food again with his hands. He started playing with food again. He started accepting food by mouth. He even started to accept solids by mouth, which was huge because we had never done that before. And, um, and I think that there were a lot of issues that Luca was facing emotionally and psychologically. Um, and, you know, we, we saw different strides, but throughout that time, Lena, Lena and I got close. Uh, you know, and became friends throughout the process, right? Because she was working so intimately, intimately with my son. And one day after so many telehealth appointments, I had been noticing for a, a long period of time that Lena's space was primarily lit, was only lit with electric lighting. And the tonality of that lighting, as you've all learned, was an interesting tonality for the time of day that our sessions were happening. And I finally, after we got close enough and I felt comfortable enough, asked her a little bit about her environment. I said, Hey, you know, I notice, I notice you use your electric light. It doesn't look like you have a lot of windows in there. Um, have you ever heard about light wellness? And, and thus it began kind of a very small integration of conversations of like, can I could just plant the bug in your ear and see if you're even interested in learning about this? And she was so much so that she agreed to uh, try the Light Wellness Master's program and all of the different tools that we threw at her. And um, the results that she's seen and that she shared have been so incredible. 
and so rewarding as a, a as a wellness coach and a consultant and as someone who really understands the change that can be seen in an individual's life. Um, I love that Luke is just sitting in the background looking like a mad scientist. He's got the most wild hair. You'll, you'll meet him in a minute. Um, he looks like he's hanging back right now, but I guarantee at some point he's going to come and want to sit on my lap. Um, but yeah, so, so Lena has, uh, she's one of the individuals who I mentioned before, sometimes I wind up crying. I'm so happy for the types of transformations that, um, the people that I work with are seeing and, um, you know, she's one of the ones who kind of brings tears to my eyes on a regular basis. And I don't know if it's because of the closeness I feel to her for her work with my son or strictly because of the, uh, you know, the the impact that these light conscious decisions have made on her life and the joy I see in her when she realizes it, um, or if it's just kind of the combination of all of it. So I'm so excited for you guys to meet Lena and hear a little bit about her story. And um, yeah, no further ado, let's welcome her into the conversation. Hi, Lena. Hello, how are you? I'm good, how are you doing? I'm good, I'm good. I feel badly that I'm not with beautiful sunlight right now, but <laughs> this is the best spot for sound in my in my place. But it's so no good to see you and and be here. Thank you for having me. You too. No, thank you. Thank you so much for joining us and sharing a little bit about your journey and your story. And, um, you know, I'm like I said, I have been so encouraged by the results that you've seen and by your commitment to our conversations and the research that I kind of give you homework on and just all the different unique ways that you've been able to incorporate this into your lifestyle and even into your patients and your students' lifestyles. So, um, you know, I would love to talk about all of that with you and just hear, let, let, you know, let you share your story and, and let everyone know that, you know, becoming light conscious really is worth it, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. So tell me a little bit about your, so tell everyone about what kind of a day in the life of Lena was like before uh, you became light conscious, you know, what your sleeping habits and kind of eating habits and um, your stressors, you know, how you respond to the stressors, just like kind of the whole nine yards, right? Share with us a little bit about that. Sure. So I would wake up pressing the snooze button so many times until the last possible 10 minute bracket of time to not hit the traffic to get to work. Uh, so no breakfast, no real self-care routine besides showering and dressing. Uh, at work, sometimes I'd arrive on, you know, on time or early enough at work where I would turn off the lights in my office, draw the curtains and take a mini nap before my first session uh, and sleep at my desk uh, because of how exhausted I felt in the morning. Um, and working in the school setting, I'd have to be on, I call it like my Mary Poppins mode, like just full of energy and fun because I work with young kids, uh, and, you know, with speech. And I feel very wiped by one to two o'clock. Um, and then I, you know, go again to do a second job doing uh, home based sessions and coming home, um, you know, it'd be already be dark out and I'd probably just go into snack mode or I would go for a lot of carbs and cereals and bread type things. And it was just not a healthy uh, routine, not listening to my body and um, it kind of really going through the motions of the drag of every day. And in many ways I felt, um, it was just, I felt very exhausted kind of throughout the day, but especially mornings uh, and then definitely in the afternoons. Hey Luca. And Say hi, uh, Lena. <laughs> he came over to you. He saw your face. Yeah. And he was like, oh, okay. Is it our time? <laughs> <laughs> time. That's right. Time. <laughs> but yeah, it's uh, it's so good to see him. He looks so good. Uh, but yeah, I mean, uh, definitely, I was someone that was a stress eater. Uh, but now, um, I'll get into it later about what I feel about now. But uh, I definitely. I wasn't, I wasn't in a good place. So, um, so yeah, that was my daily routine. 
Yeah. Well, so with yeah. that said, you know, what was it? I mean, we, I had had a couple of conversations with you about this and, and I was just like, well, did you know this? And did you know that? And I remember one of the first things that we kind of kind of talked about was the post lunch dip and how that was a, a normal right. reaction to circadian health. And, um, and I, you know, and I think you're like, oh, well, this this is different. And I think I actually wound up sharing with you because I I was I was realizing in hindsight a lot of issues with one of my friends from the past who had passed away, and I was having a really hard time with it because I was like, oh my god, I don't want to see anyone else go through something like that and end up in that position. And I was like, and I love you, Lena. Like I just want I want you to be well, and I see that light, and I just you know so. So what was it that kind of helped you realize that this was, you know, like, yes, we talked and, and you you invested in learning more about it, but what was it that really intrigued you to like say, wow, this is something that I really need to be actively uh, including in my daily lifestyle and paying attention to, like, this is no joke. Like, was there an aha moment or was it, you know, a series of moments? Um, certainly I would say that aha moment came when we had that conversation, uh, when I probably had panda raccoon eyes, uh, you know, doing after a session with Luca, uh, through, uh, zoom mm -hmm. and, uh, was just eye opening to see that, uh, one of my client's parents was like noting in my own face and just my, possibly even just my skin tone and everything that I wasn't at my healthiest and not looking as good or maybe just looking very run down in a way um, that's maybe it, I lived in a at the time that we were doing um, telehealth and during the height of the pandemic I was living in New York City living in a basement apartment with very few windows uh, in fact uh, was most of the all of our light was you know electronic electric overhead lights uh and not even table lamps and yeah not table lamps it's just yeah so we my fiance and i um sometimes would not even leave the apartment i'm talking about days on end uh we would have all our groceries delivered if we did go outside we'd go for like nighttime walks and i realized we were just basically nocturnal we really reverse cycled we were going to bed at 2 3 a.m waking up kind of early 8 9 o'clock for the start of our day and it was just a, not a good uh, place so i could see how it, hearing somebody else tell me hey have you thought about light and and daylight and exposure and i realized wow yeah this is so not healthy what i'm doing um and i it was i was just very grateful that someone took the time and care to to bring it up to me and I was definitely intrigued to learn more about it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it was, yeah, I'm glad that it was something that you took to heart and really personalized for yourself that it was, Oh, there he goes. There he goes people. Uh, so yeah, so I'm glad, but you know, with doing that, you were living more of a nocturnal lifestyle. Um, and like you said, it was very hard to keep a normal feeding schedule or eating schedule and, you know, a very, uh, abnormal sleep schedule. Um, you know, what were some of the ways, because now then you wound up moving into a new apartment. You were actually, when yeah. we started discussing this, you were in the process of, um, of renovating a space that you and your fiance had I, I believe purchased um so you guys you know you were you were on your way you were like i'm on my way we've got lots of natural light in the new space yeah. so you know as we you know through this course of working with each other over i want to say like really really working with each other over the like the last 12 weeks um, you know, you were transitioning back then. Um, so what kind of challenges did you face in receiving healthy light or, you know, what were some ways that you were able to start incorporating once you became light conscious, how did you start incorporating healthy light more in kind of transitioning away from a more nocturnal lifestyle? Um, and you know, what were so how, how did you get creative with it? Yeah. So certainly I needed to establish like a, a much better morning routine, uh, even not even the, just the light wellness perspective, but even my body health uh, overall, like nutrition perspective as well. So uh, 
you know, getting up a little bit earlier uh, and making sure that I had, um, you know, a nice salad breakfast already set up to go, having my coffee and everything ready with my mug right by my uh, sunlit coming window. So I had nice daylight uh, for that morning. And then I like to get it to early a little, um, get to work a little earlier so that I could uh, take a kind of walk around my school campus in the daylight. So it's just kind of building morning routine um, to get that optimal light in the beginning. Um, we moved our television to not block so much sunlight from one of our windows uh, in our apartment. Um, and then I just kind of try to go for more walks and just more, uh, I try to have some more movement incorporated every day. Uh, my nephew lives down the block and he's full of energy and I like to go see him sometimes or he has a new puppy, you know, so it's little things that um, I realize I can take advantage of the day. I can own the day if I just t take these little extra measures to to build those new routines. So that certainly helped a lot. And certainly having the app, uh, the app was a game changer too, because I realized, whoa, it's such a big difference when it's downcast versus full sunbeam light. Um, and getting uh, kind of, it was playing around a lot in the beginning. Some of the apps I used initially were uh, I felt giving a lot of varied readings, but uh, talking with Regina uh, really helped me see what readings I was supposed to really look at the average of the book candles and uh, getting into specifics on a weekly basis was very helpful too, because any kind of issue that came up in incorporating these practices, it was all, I was able to really get to um, get some answers and get some good strategies from Regina for our weekly talks. Hmm. I don't hear you anymore. Hmm. My bad. Sorry. Oh, there we go. <laughs> I muted myself to make sure that you didn't hear Luca. Um, oh. So, yeah, I found that that has been one big area of support uh, across the board is that, you know, as much education as we provide and as many guidelines as we provide, there's always some question about the proper application of it or the way to make the best use of it or maybe a little bit of confusion on you know the specific metrics or the time and the exposure because it's also personalized um and i find that those that tended to be you know kind of very prevalent in our conversations and yeah. you yeah and you brought up something hey mind your grind mind your grind um, you brought up something very, uh, what I think is very important, and it's something that I've been reiterating over the course of this workshop, is that while, yes, there are free light meter applications available on phones, because of the way that phones are designed, they're all different, and that meter, that sensor is embedded inside you know, the hardware of the phone, it's creating this natural shielding agent. So you're never actually getting the exact right quality of light. And because of the algorithms that are designed into apps are different depending on who that manufacturer is, it's never really truly accurate. And so that's why I'm such a big proponent of individuals who are becoming like conscious and committing to this lifestyle, really invest in a real professional light meter. And professional light meters aren't crazy expensive, right? Um, but that's why, be, but who do you look for? How do you know what it is? And that's why we've included the light meter inside the you know the wellness masters program was so that you, know, you guys don't have to think about that yourselves and we you can just take our recommendation and at the end of the day i've used three or four different manufacturers professional light meters but they all wind up coming up with the same type of values because it's designed professionally for light readings not just something that's embedded in the phone that you know needs some sort of an algorithm right so um i do think it's really interesting that that you did bring that up because that's something we really haven't discussed much um you know throughout the course of this but um you know knowing what you know about your lifestyle and how you got creative like i love the fact that you were incorporating walks in the morning um 
um, you know, that you incorporate walks with your students as well, right? You've mentioned that before that yeah. you, you know, when you see some of your your students or your special needs stu uh, students and patients specifically that they're they're not focusing as much or um, you know, they're they're not really they don't settle down for their nap time and things. You you get ahead of it and you take them for that walk or take them out for 15 to 30 minutes of, you know, recess or do a lesson outside or something, so an exercise outside um, in order to make sure that they're getting their daily light because we don't have control over anyone else's environment, but that is something that you had some level of control of that you could infuse and incorporate into your practice, right? Absolutely. Um, I love that. Do you think that it would be beneficial, given given the fact that we don't have that type of control? Do you think it's beneficial to invest in electric, you know, light therapy solutions that have been spectrally engineered to support human health, whether that's in your personal life or in your, you know, your work practice or your work environment, especially given your types of work environments? Do you feel that, you know, investing in electric light solutions is, you know, of quality? But also just as a reminder, you know, um, I know I said that Lena had been working with me last year. We were in New York. So Lena's in New York City right now, um, you know, where they have extended winters and seasonal affective disorder is a real thing, right? Oh, yeah. um, <laughs> you know, just keep that in mind as well. The further we move from the equator, kind of the harder it is on our bodies to stay aligned to daylight. Um, so with that said, what do you think, Lena? Oh, certainly, yes. It just could take the guesswork out of a lot of, oh, right, what, what, when do I turn this on? What do I, what kind of level do I need here? Um, I live in, I still live in a basement apartment, but it has much more uh, light. Um, but there's a lot of people that, um, especially in dense uh, cities who don't get the, the, the adequate um, daylight uh, into their main when they're uh, in their workplace or in their homes and uh, why not get the most out of it when you can have the the, the electric solutions uh, there all set for you and I, I mean I certainly have, there's more for me to do it's like a constant oh okay, just monitoring seeing how I feel that's a thing it's like my body is my own is my own best indicator of my uh, how I'm feeling. My I got up without my alarm. I've been not having to get up with an alarm uh, for the past few weeks, which is nice. I mean, I still have it just in case, but I don't get up. I don't necessarily need it as much. And um, it's it's a whole oh, it's a whole new thing. I, I never thought I'd look forward to getting up and getting started for my day. I'm like, I got this day. I own the day. And that's been the game changer. So why not have something in your home that's gonna be tailored for your own, you know, environment? That's yeah. awesome. I love that. I got this day. I own yeah. that. Day. That's how yeah. you should feel about life, you know? Yeah. And rather than being like, this day really handed itself to me, you know? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and, and I feel like that's really where so many people are at for so long. I know that's where I was at. I mean, I was dragging butt left and right, up and down, and New York City in and of itself will kick your butt. So if yeah. you're not well and you don't, you're not taking the measures to make sure that you can be well, right, then you're just, you're depreciating your quality of life in an area that's already very difficult to have a good quality of life, right? Um, you know, especially if you're, you know, you're, you're just moving there and starting out, right? Rather yeah. than being kind of born and raised, right? right. So um, it, it's really, really hard. And, uh, you know, making sure that you have the stamina, right? That you're well rested and you have the stamina and that your, you know, your mental and emotional health are kind of balanced and intact. Nice. Oh, <laughs> 
<laughs> Each therapist in you is just like, oh my God, your heart is bursting, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> he wants to join the conversation, everyone. Yeah, he does. I see that. <laughs> um, you're going to hear this happening. He's like, listen, I, I can keep up with you guys, too. Um, you know, having an ability, I mean, in New York City is stressful, right? People are always trying to step on you. You're always trying to get ahead. You're always trying. There's so many reasons to lose your cool in the city, right? Um, have you found that, you know, in balancing circadian health, that you're kind of finding a ba more balance in your kind of mental and emotional health so that you're just not losing your cool as readily as you would have? Is that something that you've been experiencing? Huge, huge, yes. So um, I think I, I was definitely not, I, I really abandoned my self-care uh, in quarantine. I think a lot of people uh, might have had the same thing. Um, it was all about deadlines and work and just being on top of finances and uh definitely this was some the being part of the the light wellness program helped like kind of see oh i need to take care of all these other aspects of my um of my body i need to make those uh you know appointments with the doctors i'm gonna see a nutritionist about my my eating habits uh so now i'm with a nutritionist now i'm um you know, incorporating movement, um, I've lost some weight and it's definitely, it's, I feel like this is a, it's not just about, usually I start diets and I go up and down with weight. Um, it just feels very different this time around because I think that we've got that foundational piece of my sleep and, uh, uh, down pat. And I definitely think that has made the biggest difference. Um, I'm, I feel so much more tuned into my body overall because of the program uh, that I don't think I would have had that had I not done it. So it absolutely has uh, uh, affected other aspects too. And I'm happy about that. Good. I'm so glad to hear that. You know, that's something that is, that's kind of a common theme where, you know, when you pay attention to this area of health, because of its nature being so fundamental to all these other areas of health, you just kind of naturally fall into this habit of paying attention to the other areas because you have to, because the only way to assess whether or not this layer of caretaking yeah. is working is by making those observations inside right. all those other pillars of wellness, right? Like, are we noticing that your post lunch dip is happening at the same, around the same time within, you know, 15 to 30 minutes of every day, right? Are you noticing that you're snacking that you know your urge or you know your hunger and your urge to snack is happening around the same time every day and that it's not really happening at night right are you noticing that the types of physical exercise efforts that you're taking are actually creating an impact in a way that they hadn't before right because now we understand that you know when you're eating for not just your metabolism type but you're eating for you know, the circadian cycle that there's a spe very specific way that your dig digestive enzymes are going to work, that your hunger hormones are going to work. And that if your eating habits don't align with that fluctuation, you know, of the timing of those biofunctions, that it's going to wind up producing negative results rather than positive results. Right. Um, and, you know, you hear all of that. We, we know that you shouldn't eat this, this type of Right. at this time of day right and we know that you should try to exercise at this time of day versus that one but you don't really know why and i don't even think that some of the professionals do. it's just what they've learned inside their practice in their training in their schooling that this is what we know based on clinical study but until you really know and understand circadian health you can't, it's really hard to make those observations and, and identify why what's working is working or why what's not working isn't working, right? Oh, yeah, absolutely. That's a really good point. I think uh, doing that, um, the work and observing yourself and doing that self-reflection uh, has made such a big impact as I, now one of my journal prompts, so now I journal and I meditate in the mornings. Uh, which I was never doing ever before. Um, one of my journal prompts I like is what do certain feelings feel like in your body? And just doing that, it's like I can explore a whole wealth of, oh yes, that sensation of anxiety or stress or happiness or whatever. And usually 
light, happy. It's all kind of, it, it isn't, uh, it, it does just, it, I feel it absolutely makes a huge difference to kind of uh, put to paper and, and record in the calendar and it made it uh, really start to make the wheels turn into, okay, so I'm feeling good. Why am I feeling good? Let me continue doing this, going down this track of, of all these practices. So Yes, yes. Because now you're seeing results rather than just feeling like you're spinning and spinning and spinning because you yeah. know what to look for now. Yeah. Rather than yeah. just going by what someone told you to do because you have to become responsible for it yourself. Because right. I can't observe those changes in you, right? right? That so. accountability piece is the big, I think it was the big, big kahuna thing. It's one thing to practice it on your own. Go be a good, do it. But the weekly chats, I think, uh, definitely cemented it and just talking or reflecting about everything. Yeah. Yeah. So, well, with that said, you know, how, how do you think they're one of the things that has been mentioned, uh, you know, and I, I, I always tell people, you know, practice makes permanence. It doesn't make perfect, right? We have to practice yeah. something. And then we had an, another individual say consistency is king and they go hand in hand. Right. And that's really what these types of kind of wellness programs and accountability programs offer and what we're offering. Um, you know, how do you feel about the structure of the program and our weekly consultations and you know do you feel that it was you know more valuable or less valuable based on the observations that you were making absolutely more valuable uh definitely i'm someone that i like to talk things out i like to kind of process through even for things um in the i think in the beginning uh, regina there were things you'd explain i would just kind of like to regurgitate it back in my own way or talk about examples of how I could apply whatever it was um, to my everyday. But that was a big thing. I just needed to make it easy to understand, easy to do. Um, and I, I think that, it, that accountability is the big thing, like follow up. How did this feel? What was your mood like? And, and I looked forward to it. It was something I was looking forward to, to chatting with you. Well, this is what this happened and I'm um, doing this with this light meter. It was uh, very helpful to have somebody there to guide along. Um, and I think on a weekly basis, that really worked for me. Um, I, it felt like someone is really taking active care in me, helping you feel like the best version of yourself. And I don't, the best way I could describe it, it was like drinking warm soup, nourishing your body. You know, it was something that, um, it, it's a, something that's tailored to your life, tailored to your routines and your everyday. And we would problem solve about some things too. I just, uh, it was, that was invaluable. That was, I think, a, the most invaluable piece of the, of the program for me were our consultations. So I'm so happy you feel that way, you know, because it is, it's, it does need to be personalized to you and reiterated, right? Like, I he, there were how many times were we talking about something where, you know, you would I would share that information and that education and kind of have this checklist of things that you could observe, but because you know, you don't know if it that biofunction is the one that's going to wind up happening. We kind of had to go through each one each week and see yeah. what you observed. And so sometimes something we talked about in week one or in week four, you know, hadn't happened yet. But then, you know, so week seven or week eight, you saw something and we were like, oh, yeah, remember that this is connected to that. And maybe that's why you're seeing that. And you're like, oh, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And then that helped you realize something else that happened. Happen, and it all just started to become a much clearer, big picture, you know, big perspective picture rather than just focusing on the one element. So it's like in the first few weeks, we kind of focused on single elements so that you could make those identifications. And then we were able to tie those elements together over time until eventually it was this comprehensive picture of all circadian health biofunctions. And I mean, and you hit all of them. Right. I, that's why I get so encouraged by you and your story, because 
you know, you first you started sleeping better, then you started, you know, feeling emotionally and mentally sound, like more sound than you had in a long time, right? And you, then yes. you felt more invigorated and felt like engaging in an active lifestyle rather than, a, you know, a more sedentary lifestyle, which it's one thing to not be able to have it, but you had the ability to, you just had to choose to, right? And that's so many of us. Like, yes, I have a sedentary, sedentary lifestyle. I have to sit here and talk a lot of the time. But at the end of the day, there are so many other ways that we can get up and get moving in our life. You know, a, a, even if it's as simple as, you know, doing jumping jacks between commercials when we're watching TV, right? I remember right, right. when I was, you know, I used to do that when I was um, a bit younger before I had really started circadian health. And I was like, how do, can I infuse? I was working three jobs. All of my jobs were within four, you know, 45 minutes to an hour and a half away from each other, depending on traffic and based on, you know, the location between them and where my home was. So I was waking up at 6 a.m. I was getting into work by eight. I was driving from that job to a second job an hour away. And then after that job, I would hit the fields because I was also a soccer coach. So I would be on the fields, but I wouldn't be running with them. I'd be standing around and watching technique. And so I wouldn't get home. I'd wake up at six and I wouldn't get home until sometimes 10 p.m. And then I needed to go to sleep. I had to eat. I had to work on our, you know, our practice plan, our game plan, our structure, or I had to work on work, right? And and I was just like, I, I didn't have any time for myself. So I remember there were times when I would come home at the end of the day and I would be watching TV and I would just kind of be hating myself because I hadn't worked out in forever. And I'm like trying, how can I be, you know, inspirational to my girls on my team if I'm like turning into this lazy slob. So I was like doing jumping jacks in commercials just to get physical fitness in. Right. But you have to have a certain drive for that. And if your, you know, your hormones aren't balanced, right, then that drive is really hard to find. And, um, and again, and no amount of, you know, no amount of um, melatonin in your system is going to help you fall asleep if your cortisol levels are just skyrocketing, right? Like if your cortisol levels are that much higher than your melatonin levels, right? You're super stressed. And that means that something is on your mind. And, um, you know, and I'll touch on that in a minute um, after our, our interview. But, um, you know, at the end of the day, there are so many things that you can do, but sometimes it takes, you know, touching base with someone who really, really supports you and helps you. I mean, professional coaches have coaches, business coaches have coaches, right? Trainers have wellness coaches. Everyone needs a coach and someone to kind of keep moving you in the right direction. Like if you think that you've gotten to the top of your game and like you're it, you're the end all be all, the reality is that you're not, right? That there's always gonna be someone else with more experience and more insight and more value to provide to you so that you can keep leveling up, right? And that's what this type of program is for, is to help you keep leveling up in your life so that you can become the best possible version of yourself. Um, and I remember, you know, one time, like you said, it was like chicken soup. I, I remember it was yeah. one of the best compliments I had ever gotten <laughs> probably. You were like, you know, talking to you every week is like chicken soup for the soul. Thank you. And I was just like, oh my God, I cried. You know, <laughs> it's like that is how you should feel, not necessarily because of me, but because that's what was brought out in you, that you felt so good that it felt like the person who was holding your hand through that process was like feeding you chicken soup, you know, and yeah. Um, and I, I love that for you. And I love that you gained so much from the work that we've done together. And um, I know we're going to be taking a little bit of a hiatus while you focus on some other areas of life. Right. But but that's again, that's the point of this. Right. These programs aren't meant to be the end all be all so that you lean and rely on, you know, me or another wellness coach forever. It's to help you take and learn that responsibility and that accountability so that you can continue to move forward. And then if you ever feel like you need me as a touchstone again, you know where to find me, right? Absolutely. Yes. So I'm so happy for you. Um, I do have kind of one final question and I've been asking everyone 
And it's kind of my challenge for the industry, right? And it's, you know, have you ever over the course of the time that we've been working together, you know, have you sought information from a general practitioner or a specialist or, or any kind of medical professional of any nature? You know, have you sought um, any insight into circadian health or asked them about circadian health? And, you know, were they able to provide quality insight or really touch on light's impact on it in any way. What kind of conversation has that been if you've had it? So I have not. Uh, definitely, I was a novice uh, about everything with light wellness uh, upon speaking, like upon meeting you. Um, so you were really my my source of everything. I just had read articles from some people, and I definitely talked to some occupational therapists about it. But it was just kind of in passing, oh yes, this is a good practice to use with students and with this and, uh, you know, blue light filters for uh, exposure to screen time. And um, it was more in that kind of respect, but I have not. And I think that'd be a beautiful thing um, for, for general practitioners to to look into having referrals for, for light wellness for sure. Certainly in, I think, kind of urban dense Northern cities with, you know, seasonal defective disorder. And I think that make, would make a big impact. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I agree. And um, that's a, you know, another big reason why we host the free workshops is, you know, just in hopes that anyone who's listening may be a, may be a part of that community or can spread the word to that community. Right. And that's why it's been such a blessing to work with you because you work inside, you know, a layer of that community and you see that impact, but not only do you work inside the medical community, you work with students and patients as well. So you kind of bridge this very interesting gap. And, and now you know that it's not, not all blue light is bad light, right? right that by right, a right. certain time of day, like, oh, maybe, maybe during daytime when our students are in school, we shouldn't be blocking blue light, right? It's nighttime that we need to be blocking blue light. If we want them to stay awake and alert, like let them get that blue light from those screens, right? right but right, right. actually maybe in instead of having a five minute break outside, we should have a 20 minute break outside, right? Exactly. Little exactly. things like that. So I, I am so happy that you chose to, you know, work with me and, and do this for yourself and really become someone who can start creating conversational impact in your area of practice and for students and patients alike. Um, and then the parents, right? I know that you have so much engagement with the parents of the patients that you work with because you have to because you work in pediatrics and you know they are responsible for bringing up yep. these children and so it becomes incumbent on us as parents to know how to best provide for them in every aspect and this is one layer that has been missing from health and caretaking that we cannot afford to miss out on anymore oh, right huge huge when you were talking about luca and the procedures when i remember we didn't do therapy for a few weeks when he had his uh heart um surgery and i was in shock and amazed and beautifully like so happy that he bounced back so beautifully from it and because you had you made sure he had that access to that light and it's like that's so I want to tell all my families um all about just making sure he's getting getting light and sure he's getting you know you have the curtains open if you're at the hospital get this and this or trying to get to try to fight for a room for good light you know yeah so, for a room for good light yeah so absolutely that was really uh, eye opening so yeah. Good. Share the guidelines with all your yeah. parents. I don't I care. Will. The guidelines are free. I should just put them up on the website. <laughs> <laughs> So, all right, Thelena, thank you so, so much. This was wonderful. I appreciate everything, all the hard work that you've put into our sessions together and for sharing, you know, so much about your journey and um, and obviously for all the incredible work that you've done with Luca. I, it's such a bummer that we're in Florida now and, and we don't wow. work with each other, but I appreciate you, you know, touching base with us and letting me pick your brain in the intermediate while we're looking for a new therapist. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. So, all right, cool. Well, thank you so much. And uh, I'll talk to you soon, though. Sounds good. I'll talk to all you right. soon. Bye. Bye.
Um, so that was Lena, everyone. She just has such a beautiful heart and a beautiful soul. And it's been a pleasure working with her um, as my son's therapist and as a client of Light Vitality Group because she really just does. She puts everything. She puts 110% into everything, um, you know, both with her time and, you know, with her heart. And I hope that that showed through, um, you know, in this particular conversation, because she was, she, she was living in a, a in, in Mark McClear's words, a dark, dank home. And, uh, and transitioned into a home of light wellness and really started, you know, creating practices that were healthy for her. And it has just made such an impact. Um, and I hope that, you know, you're following your light wellness guidelines and you're able to see those types of observations and impact as well. And sometimes it's really hard to make those observations and to put two and two together or three and three or even one and one, right? It's hard to see how they build on each other. And that's what this, these consultations provide and that's what this coaching provides um, I will say that as we wrap up day nine, launching the light wellness program, I have had so many interesting conversations with so many of you. And one of the things that I've realized is that the light wellness master's program might be structured for a different type of community. And so if you are someone who feels that you would benefit from these types of services and from making these observations and having someone hold your hand, you know, I encourage you, yes, to invest in the light bulbs, to invest in consulting. I encourage you to work with us because you know what we're doing and we are seeing incredible results. Um, I am going to be restructuring the Light Wellness Master Program for the next launch that is going to be taking place in about eight to 10 weeks. So stay inside the Light Wellness Experience Network here on our Facebook group. Keep touching base with us on social media, on LinkedIn, on our website as we are undergoing these business development changes to see how we're going to be representing these programs and these packages to you so that you feel that you're getting the most for the value that you put into it. Um, you know, like I said, when I started these free community education workshops, they were free for a reason because no one knew about it. And um, at the time, we didn't have a cost-effective retro, retrofit spectrally engineered LED light bulb in order to back up the education that we're providing you now. We did not have it four years ago. Hell, we didn't have it three years ago or two years ago, but we have it now, which is why it's not just education anymore. There's practical application that is within your realm of possibility. You don't have to buy a $300 light, right? You don't have to pay a contractor to install them, right? You don't even necessarily have to have a dimmer. It's just becoming aware of how to get the best kind of daylight and how to tune by your evening electrical lighting uh, scenarios. And we want to do that. So if you don't feel that the Light Wellness Master's Program is for you, that is, that is all right. We are going to be restructuring it in order to make it more community friendly for individuals who see the real benefit and value of it, but may just not be at a point to invest in a 16 week uh, program at this time. Um, so if you, you know, visit our website, we do have a number of services. Um, you know, if you are invest or interested in the wellness program, I am going to keep the, um, the registration period open until the end of next Sunday to give you time to really think it through, to touch base with me personally and talk through more of those details and see if maybe there might be a way to more specifically tailor uh, a program for you and your lifestyle that's not just 100% set in stone, right? Because we understand that your lifestyle is that your lives are demanding that you're um you know exposable or uh, a, a kind of expendable income might be more demanding right now for other areas of life um and at the end of the day we want you to feel well this is to serve you 
So just know that we're not going to leave you hanging. You know, if this is something that you want and you, you know, you can't get there until for the next eight to 10 weeks, um, there are other things that we provide. We provide regular one on one consultations. We provide the light bulbs. Right. And we can work with you on how to identify and structure a lifestyle under light and a program that works for you specifically. So um, with that said, thank you so, so much for hanging out with us over the last week and a half and really investing in learning about what this type of light can do for you um, and you know in sharing some of your stories in the direct messages with us or on you know the group wall you guys have been so brave and courageous in sharing you know what it is you're looking to gain from this um, like we said from the get-go health you know a health and wellness conversation is so intimate and so personal and sharing it on a public platform isn't always the easiest thing to do and so you know we mend your uh, courage in this type of an effort because it's going to take community awareness and community sharing to spread this word and spread this message and really show how important it is and how much we demand it right um that we demand it from our health care from the people who are responsible inside our traditional health care markets that we demand it from the people who are taking care of us who we rely on right that we demand it from the people who we love who are relying on us to just keep fighting and keep you know pushing for a higher quality of life even when it feels like it's just not possible right when we feel like things are just slipping away and the old, you know it's all downhill from here it's not i promise you it's not all downhill from here because we didn't know that there was a better way to climb up that hill and i hope that you all realize that now and that you really are taking the light wellness guidelines to heart and applying them and if there's anything that we can do to support you in that effort just know that you know where to find us www.lightvitalitygroup.com Com, Facebook group, Facebook groups, Light Wellness Experience Network, and uh, I am Regina Lassell. I'm going to sign off. I hope to hear from all of you at one point or another sooner than later. Um, and uh, yeah, just keep at it. We are rooting for you. We are so excited about your ability to flex this caretaking muscle. And uh, just remember that no matter how crazy life seems, that there is always a way to live lighthearted. See ya.